Hey guys, and welcome to my A-level physics revision video, continuing with section one, in which we're going to have a look at radioactive decay. We're also going to go on to photons and electromagnetic waves. So let's start by looking at radioactive decay. Now, what is radioactive decay exactly? Well, it basically happens if the nucleus in an atom, the positively charged nucleus right at the centre of the atom, is unstable. And that is to say that when it's unstable, it doesn't like the way it currently is at the moment. For whatever reason, there are a couple of different reasons as to why, but it's unstable and wants to decay into a different type of nucleus. And what will this nucleus do? Well, it's going to release radiation. Now, this radiation comes in three different types. There's alpha radiation, beta radiation, and gamma radiation. And we're going to go through each one of those different types of radiation. So, alpha radiation consists of alpha particles. And alpha particles are made up of two protons and two neutrons. So they're essentially exactly the same as a helium nucleus. And the symbol for an alpha particle, um, the, using the chemical symbol notation, is 4, 2, alpha, because there's two protons, has a total nucleon number of 4, and we just use the symbol alpha to represent an alpha particle. Now, alpha radiation basically happens when a nucleus is just too big. I mentioned in the last video that there is a constant battle between the strong nuclear force, which is keeping the atoms together, or keeping the protons and neutrons um, in the nucleus together, and the electromagnetic force, which is pushing it apart. And when you have a lot of nucleons in the nucleus, then the electromagnetic force becomes uh, comparable with the strong force because, of course, the distance between this side of the nucleus and this side of the nucleus is a lot bigger than, say, in a, high, in a helium nucleus, for instance, then the two particles are going to be very, very close together. So there's going to be that short-range attraction from the strong nuclear force. But, of course, at these great distances there's going to be not as good a distance and so the electromagnetic force is going to kick in and the alpha particles are, are going to tend to fly apart. And that is basically what happens in alpha decay. We can normally write this reaction using the following equation that say we have a parent nucleus X which has a nucleon number of A and a proton number of Z it will then decay to a daughter nucleus, which we'll call Y for the sake of argument, and it's going to have four less nucleons and two less protons, because of course proton numbers decrease by two, because of course there's two protons in an alpha particle, and the total nucleon number uh, of an alpha particle is four, so therefore the daughter nucleus is going to have four less protons than the parent nucleus. So, and obviously you're going to get the alpha particle as well. So that's a very typical reaction equation for, um, for alpha decay. Next we're going to come and have a look at beta radiation. Now a beta particle is simply an electron and it's given the symbol 0 0-1 beta because it has a charge that is equal and opposite to that of a proton, so we simply write the uh, nucleon number as a zero. So the question is, how do we get an electron to come flying out of the nucleus? Well, simply, a neutron here actually changes into a proton and releases an electron. It also 
releases another particle called a neutrino as well. In this case, it would actually release an antineutrino. We'll certainly discuss more on that in the section on quarks. But an antineutrino, this guy here, has virtually no mass and no charge. But they are, they are emitted to conserve lepton number, but we'll talk more about the conservation laws in particle interactions in a future video. And we can also write the beta reaction as an equation. So say like before we have our original nucleus X, which has a nucleon number of A and a proton number of Z, that is going to decay to a daughter nucleus, which now is actually going to have the same nucleon number. But of course, if a neutron changes into a proton, then you're going to get an extra proton in this nucleus. So the proton number of this daughter nucleus increases by one, and you're gonna get the beta particle and this anti-electron neutrino. So when do we get beta reactions occurring? Well, basically, if you think about what's happening, a neutron's changing into a proton, but why would it have to do that? It would only do that if there are too many neutrons in a nucleus. So we get beta minus decay when there are too many neutrons in an atom's nucleus. And finally, we're gonna have a look at gamma radiation. The gamma radiation is just electromagnetic radiation that's emitted by an unstable nucleus. Now, gamma radiation is by far the most penetrating. It can actually pass through thick metal plates, unlike the other two. But since it's just radiation, it doesn't actually have any mass or any charge. And you normally get gamma radiation just after alpha or beta emission. This, this nucleus right here, um, say in a typical alpha reaction, um, has normally has a lot of energy. So how's it going to get rid of that energy? It's going to get rid of it in the form of electromagnetic radiation. Next, we come on to electromagnetic waves. Now, light is in fact an electromagnetic wave, but it's a very small part of the electromagnetic spectrum. It's just that our eyes can't actually detect any of the other parts. If we could, the world would definitely appear to be very different. So for example, all hot objects will emit, will emit radiation that's actually in the infrared part of the spectrum. And we can only detect that part of the spectrum using special cameras. In a vacuum, all electromagnetic waves travel at the same speed, which is the speed of light given by the symbol C. And it has a value of 299,792, 299,792,458 meters per second. But since this number is very, very, very close to three times 10 to the eight, in all calculations, you would always use three times 10 to the eight meters per second. Now you'll recall that the wavelength and frequency of a wave are related by the equation that the wave speed is equal to the wave frequency multiplied by the wavelength. So we can see that as the wavelength gets shorter, the frequency of the wave will increase because all electromagnetic waves travel at, at C. So C is a constant. So as this gets smaller, this gets bigger. So we can actually draw the electromagnetic spectrum uh, in terms of its, its of wavelength. So we start off small and now we're gonna increase the frequency, decrease the wavelength until we get to the really, really high frequency, low wavelength end of the spectrum. So around about in the middle here, we have visible light. But this is only a very, very, very narrow part of the spectrum. 
it's only from 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. That is just the visible light range. This end of the spectrum, we're talking about, you know, tens of tens of meters or hundreds of meters. So here we're down in, in the nanometer part of the spectrum. And over here, we're talking typical lengths of the atom. So here we'll go around about 10 to the minus, 10 to the minus 12, I would say. And here we're about 10 to the three or something like that. Of course, that is meters and that is meters. So on the very low frequency, long wavelength part of the spectrum, you have the radio waves. And after that is the microwave part of the spectrum. And then increasing frequency, again, we have the infrared. And then this very narrow band of visible, visible wavelengths that we can detect. After that is ultraviolet light and then even higher energy we have x-rays and the highest energy the highest frequency are gamma rays but now i want to ask the question what exactly is an electromagnetic wave well it's a transverse wave which means that the oscillations are perpendicular to the direction of of motion, the direction of propagation of the wave, and it consists of an electric component and a magnetic component. And these components actually oscillate at right angles. So say here we have our electric component oscillating up and down, we have the magnetic component oscillating in, in this plane here, and then we have the direction of motion which is going in that direction there. So actually drawing this out, we'd have the electric component oscillating in, in that plane, if you like, you know, this surface right here, um, this is basically referred to as a plane. Um, and then you've got the magnetic component oscillating in this plane but of course the wave as a whole is actually traveling in that direction there. So if we maybe give these a set of axes, and if we say that this is Z, that's Y, and that's X, the electric field is oscillating up and down in the, in the X direction. The magnetic component is oscillating in the back and forth in the y direction. And the whole wave is of course moving in the z direction right there. It's important to note that the electric and magnetic components are what's known as in phase with one another. So as you can see, this peak here of the magnetic field actually lines up with this peak here of the electric field. And phase is a important concept when it comes to dealing with waves in a future video. Now, how do we generate electromagnetic waves? Well, they're actually produced when charged particles lose energy. So an example is, say, a fast moving electron. Say we have our electron moving along like this. If this electron is slowed down or undergoes any kind of acceleration or deceleration, then it emits electromagnetic radiation. Another example of this is in the atom, electrons can actually change which energy level they're in. And so, say an electron moves from this energy level down to this energy level, it will emit radiation because it's losing energy. So it's that change in energy which causes electrons to emit radiation. When electromagnetic waves are emitted though, they actually are emitted in short bursts. And these are referred to as photons. And it's helpful to think of it as a packet of waves, but we can treat these packets as particles for all intents and purposes. And it actually turns out that treating them as particles 
is a very useful thing to do when describing certain quantum mechanical effects, such as the photoelectric effect. Now in 1905, it was Einstein that said that the energy of a photon is directly proportional to its frequency. So he said that the energy is equal to a constant, which is called H, times the frequency. I know it's kind of a bit weird to think of frequency of a particle since only waves have a frequency, but it's the frequency of the corresponding wave which this particle is representing. And H is what we call Planck's constant. And it has a value of 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. And of course the units for Planck's constant can be derived from this equation right here. If energy has units of joules and frequency has units of seconds to the power of minus one, because of course frequency is one over the period, and period is of course a measure of time, then Planck's constant is going to be measured in joule seconds. And now to consider a laser beam. So here we have a, a sort of a box, and what it's doing is it's emitting a laser beam that's coming out just like that. And this laser beam consists of photons, and all of these photons are emitted at the same frequency. So all these photons are of the same energy, according to this equation. So we know that the power of this laser beam is the energy transferred per second. So power equals the energy divided by the time. So if we know the energy carried by one photon is HF, and, and if we also know the number of photons that are passing a certain point per second, we can then calculate the power of the laser. So we can say that the power of the laser is n, the number of photons passing a point per second, times hf, which is the energy carried per photon. So the energy carried by one photon multiplied by the number of photons passing a point per second is the power of the laser. Now, what might be helpful rather than putting n is to write a little dot over the n. Now this dot basically it's not actually assessed in A level but it's actually helpful to put a little dot over it just so that you know it represents the rate. So it's not actually physically the number of photons, it's the number of photons per second. And if we think about this units wise this is going to have units of photons per second or, yeah, photons per second, and that is the energy per photon. So photons per second multiplied by the energy per photon is going to give the energy per second, because those two units are going to cancel out. So that basically, if you're asked to work out the power of a laser beam, is how, you, how you'd work. So if you're told the number of photons per second, uh, Planck's constant you'll be given to, will be given to you, and the frequency of the photons, then you can work out the power. And just one thing I want to note, this frequency right here, this is not the same as the number of photons being emitted per second. This is the frequency of the electromagnetic wave that, it's, that this photon is corresponding to. So I hope that helps and I'll see you in the next video.